Hello, this is Chef John from FoodWishes.com with Panettone. That's right, I'm very excited to show you my very first attempt ever at making Panettone. And I'll admit to being a little bit intimidated because from what I read, this is supposed to be one of the hardest breads in the world to make. In fact, one article compared it to climbing Mount Everest, which sounds a little dramatic. I mean, I don't think there's dozens of people that die each year making this bread, or at least not suddenly. But anyway, as you'll see, this came out really well. So this is either easier than people say, or I had a good amount of beginner's luck. But either way, let's go ahead and get started by starting the starter, which we're going to need to make the day before. And we'll do that by mixing some flour and water together, to which we're going to add some of our already made sourdough starter. And we'll go ahead and stir that together. And I hope you have some of that in your fridge, but if you don't, in the blog post I'm going to tell you how to make it without it. And what we'll do once that's mixed is go ahead and cover it, and just leave it out at room temp overnight. And not only is this mixture going to add some volume and flavor to our dough, it's also, believe it or not, going to help the finished loaf stay fresher longer. And then once that's set, we should move on to the other thing we should do the day before. And that would be to soak some chopped up dried fruit in some type of liquor. Okay, I'm using white rum. And as far as my fruit selection, I went with pineapple, cherry, and golden raisin. But there are so many other things you could use. So feel free to investigate other options. You are, after all, the James Comey of your panettone. But anyway, we'll go ahead and mix that up the night before and let that fruit absorb the booze, stirring occasionally. And then once those two things are set the next day, we can actually move on to making the dough, which will begin by dissolving a package of yeast in some very warm but not too hot water. And as usual, we'll let that sit for about 10 minutes before adding the following ingredients. All right, to that we're gonna add a couple eggs, as well as some white sugar. We'll also toss in a spoon of pure vanilla extract, as well as some freshly grated orange and lemon zest. And then for whatever reason, I decided to take a whisk and give this a mix before adding our starter and flour. You probably don't have to, but it's too late now. And once I had done that, I went ahead and grabbed my starter from the day before, which looked beautifully bubbly and smelled amazing. And what we'll do is give that a stir and dump it into our mixing bowl. And like I said, if you don't have some sourdough starter, don't worry. I'll tell you in the blog post how to make a cheater version. But anyway, we'll go ahead and dump that in, at which point we'll go ahead and finish this off by adding our flour. And I'm just using all purpose here, although some recipes do call for bread flour. And at this point, we'll grab our dough hook and start kneading this in our stand mixer. Although as soon as I lowered that hook in, I realized I forgot the salt. So I stopped and added it, because you never, ever want to forget the salt. And then what we're going to do is let this knead for a long time, like for 10 minutes or so, until we've achieved a very, very smooth, very, very elastic dough. And early on, if you need to stop it and scrape down the sides, go ahead. But like I said, we'll let this knead for about 10 minutes until we've created something that looks like this. All right, like I said, very smooth and very elastic. And if we pull that dough with our spatula, it should sort of snap back into place. And then once that's been accomplished, we'll go ahead and add our room temperature butter. Okay, ice cold's not gonna work here. Make sure it's room temp. And we're gonna need that for another five minutes or so, or until that butter is completely mixed in and we've created, once again, a very smooth, very elastic, somewhat shiny dough. And once again, you might have to turn off the machine a couple times and scrape down the sides until it all starts to come together. So this is what mine looked like about five minutes later. So yes, we are talking about a very, very soft, somewhat sticky dough here, which is probably one of the reasons people say this is a hard bread to make. All right, generally people are scared of really soft doughs, but don't be, you'll be fine. But anyway, let me go ahead and transfer that onto my work surface so you can get a better look. And then what I did using some slightly damp fingers, as well as the help of my bench scraper, is sort of wrestle and fold that a few times into some sort of dough ball shape. And by the way, one way you can tell if you've developed enough gluten is that you can stretch it so thin you can see light through it without it tearing, which they call the window pane test, because you're supposed to stretch it out between two figures in front of a window. But I'm not going to, because I can tell just by pinching and stretching like this. And then what I did is transfer that back into my bowl that I didn't even bother cleaning out, I usually do, but I didn't feel like it. And then what we'll do is cover that and let it rise until doubled, which is gonna take a while. Okay, these rich doughs rise pretty slowly. So mine actually took about three hours, which was totally worth the wait, if for no other reason just the feeling you get when you punch it down. Man, that feels good. And what we'll wanna do at this point is transfer that back onto our table. And then once deflated, again using some damp fingers in our bench scraper, we will fold that back into some kind of ballish shape because what we're gonna to need to do is transfer this into a plastic bag and refrigerate it overnight. 
Oh yeah, we're talking about a three-day bread here. All right, so if you want this bread today, you have to start it two days ago. But anyway, trust me, it'll be worth the wait. So I went ahead and transferred that into a plastic bag and popped it in the fridge overnight. And by the way, we're not just doing this stuff to make you wait for nothing. All right, this overnight fermentation in the fridge really does improve the flavor and probably texture. So I did pop mine in the fridge overnight and then pulled it out the next morning, at which point it looked like this. And what we'll do is go ahead and remove the bag. I just rip it open. I know some of you would wash this and reuse it, but I don't swing that way. And then what we'll do is go ahead and press this out into some sort of square or rectangle shape. And because the dough is nice and cold and that butter is stiffened up, it's a little easier to work with. And then once I get it to about this flatness, I'll sprinkle it with a little bit of flour and then roll it out a little thinner with my rolling pin. And the whole reason we're doing this is that so we can scatter over our boozy dried fruit and then roll this up. And theoretically that way all our fruit will be evenly distributed. So I went ahead and applied my dried fruit to the surface, which by now had absorbed all that rum. But I ended up not using it all because as I was doing this, I was thinking, man, this is like way too much fruit. So I actually only ended up using about three quarters of it, which as you'll see in the final shots, probably wasn't the best idea. I probably should have used it all. But anyway, once that was spread out, like I said, we'll go ahead and roll the dough up nice and tight. And please accept my apologies for the blurriness. See, that's one of the reasons I've never won an Oscar. So let's fast forward. And then once that's been rolled up, I went ahead and rolled both ends up towards the middle, attempting somehow to get it back into some kind of round shape. And if at all possible, try to end up with a good amount of dough on the top. Okay, so I sort of worked that around until, like I said, I ended up with some kind of smooth dough over the top. And then once that's been accomplished, what we need to do is transfer this into a paper panettone mold, which come in this shape, the shorter, wider one, as well as a tall, skinny version. And yes, of course, in the blog post, I'm going to tell you where to find those. And then what we'll need to do is cover this and let it rise until it's at least two thirds of the way up the sides, which because we're starting with cold dough, is gonna take like three or four hours. But don't go by time, go until it looks like this. And by the way, a few hours in, I took off the plastic because it was touching the top, it was kind of sticking and I got scared. You can see the marker left right there. But anyway, the point is let your dough proof in this mold until it looks like this. At which point we will carefully brush the surface with an egg wash which is one egg beaten with a splash of water. And then once that's been applied to the entire surface, we will take a razor or a sharp knife and cut across into the top about a quarter to a half inch down, which is not just done to make this look really cool, although that's a big part of it. We actually need to do that so it rises properly and we achieve that beautiful signature dome shape. So we'll go ahead and slice the top just like that. And then our last official act before this goes in the oven is to place a small piece of butter right in the middle, which is probably more traditional than practical, since I doubt that's gonna make much of a difference, but do it anyway. And that's it, we are finally ready to bake. So we will go ahead and transfer that into the center of a 350 degree oven for about 40 to 45 minutes, or until it looks like this, which would be beautifully browned and spectacularly gorgeous. I mean, look at that. That was so beautiful, I didn't even really care how this tasted. And then if you're thinking, hey, this is probably ready to eat right now. Well, unfortunately, you could not be more wrong. We actually need to let this cool for two hours upside down. Oh yeah, you heard me. Which is why I'm going to poke in two skewers on either side and then flip this over onto a panettone cooling hole, which I had cut into my table. But if you don't happen to have access to a panettone cooling hole, you can just flip this over on top of a Dutch oven or a stock pot or something like that. And by cooling this upside down, there's not going to be any collapsing, and it's going to help us retain a beautiful light texture. So take that gravity, and then after somehow waiting for a couple hours for this to fully cool, we will go ahead and pull out those skewers, and finally be able to cut in and see how we did. So I went ahead and sliced out a wedge. And like I said, this looks so magnificent, I really didn't care how it tasted. But I'm very happy to report for a first attempt, it tasted really good which didn't really surprise me. What did surprise me was how amazing the texture was for a first attempt. Okay, it was rich and buttery, but it was just impossibly light and airy. The only major surprise was where the heck did all that fruit go? I thought I had way too much and ended up thinking I didn't have enough. But anyway, besides that, I was extremely happy and went ahead and cut another piece so I could try some with butter, which is even a better way to enjoy this. 
And for whatever reason, I found this shape to be more enjoyable than the wedge. So I'm going to suggest you cut yours in half and then down into slices. And while this bread was great plain, and even better spread with butter, I'm going to show you a third and what I consider ultimate way to enjoy this. And that would be lightly toasted with butter. Okay, that really is the ultimate way to enjoy this bread. Preferably with a nice hot cup of coffee. But anyway, that's it. My first attempt at panettone. Yes, it took three days and many hours. But as far as actual work involved, there really wasn't that much. And like I said, I was really happy with how this came out. Although next time I am going to add all the fruit and maybe make a few tweaks, which you'll read about on the blog post. But bottom line, this was not even close to as hard as people made it out to be. So for that reason and many others, I really do hope you give this a try soon. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Enjoy.